I had a job in Europe, fell through with COVID. Then I had a job in, I signed to go back to Canada. And then that was the same week that they, that they um, canceled the NBA and the NHL and all that. That same week when I signed was the same week Canada was like, oh, well, got to cancel the season. Then, then I had a job in South America and I was like, you sure y'all going to have a league? And he was like, yeah. 24 hours later. No. <laughs> <laughs> I remember how I said we're sure we're not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, and that was all like what, March? That was all in March. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, that's how I got to like, you know, COVID. I'm like, okay, well now, now I know for sure that I'm not going to get a job in a market that I want to go to until like next summer. Cause the only places I would go are like Asia, Australia. So now I'm just sitting at the home, at, at home, just like, oh, in COVID with everybody else. So, yeah. So it career. kind of, I guess it's kind of interesting then in listening since COVID shut it down. So are you still, I don't want to say actively try. So where, what's the status of your, your career now? I mean, obviously you're a grad assistant for mm-hmm. now, but I mean, is it something that let's say COVID is cured tomorrow uh, or obviously, you know, it might be a little bit of, a little bit of time. I mean, would you say you're done or would you say it's. Yes. I, I think I'm kind of more like, like that. Like I'm like, mm, you know, because something can come up um, and, you know, in terms of just where I'm at mentally, physically, like I'm, you know, I was, I have plenty of years of basketball left in me, but, you know, being an adult, you know, a little bit older and can make more, you know, decisions like I, I'm going to be home for at least, you know, however long, like I'm cool with just, you know, getting into this right now. Something comes up basketball, I have to deal with it when it comes, but yeah, like as of right now, I still got, like I'm signed to it. I'm signed to an agent. Like as we speak, like, you know, I got agents about stuff or, you know, I, cause I've always had that open line with like all the agents. Cause I've always been used to doing my own work for myself. So all of that's still kind of right there too, but you know, my, uh, you know, my focus right now, obviously is a grad assistant and Mason and stuff like that. So. Your recent member of the George Mason coaching staff under a different regime here, uh, obviously played under Larry Nega, had some relationship with Paul Hewitt. Um, now under Dave Paulson, uh, how did you connect with the current staff to get this position as a grad assistant? Um, so to be to be like to be honest, the 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 position really just fell out of the fell out of the sky. Like it, it I guess it was a perfect perfect time and perfect situation um, in terms of just uh, you know I think they had a, a grad assistant open up uh, because I think they were able to have a second grad assistant because there's one now and now I'll be the second one and I think the position opened up like you know what maybe a couple months ago um, and they were floating. They were floating uh, names around. I guess I heard they said they were floating some names around. And, like, guys, you know, guys that they could potentially hit up to see if they wanted to do it. And um, I talked to – so when Paulson initially reached out to me, he sent me a text and was like, hey, like, this is Dave Paulson, George Mason. I just want to get you on the phone, you know, and talk when we can. And I'm like, oh. I saw it and I, I thought – like, I literally thought, like, okay, it's either got to be about recruiting somebody or it's got to be about, like, coaching. You know what I mean? I just thought that, you know, right away. So – um yeah they uh so they they said that when they brought me up uh they didn't my name came up you know I, and i know doing simpkins a little bit uh just from the math and seeing him around um and uh i'm not think tyler jordan is back there he was there when i was in school so tyler jordan is like there he's like video and analytics um but essentially you know they they pretty much asked everybody at mason about me you know like the handies you know um and the debbie corbados and you know people around the administration everybody just kind of was like hey Ike's a great guy to, to bring in if you if you guys want to. Like, he's just a great guy. You know, he went here, great, great work ethic, good kid. And, you know, pretty much, you know, everybody just putting in a really good word for me without me, me even knowing, you know. And um, when he yeah, when he contacted me, he kind of just told me about the situation. I'm just like, yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense in terms of me, you know, not doing too much right now. Um, you know, COVID's got everybody locked down. But, you know, I, I – hadn't played the season was over I was about to play this season it got canceled and I'm kind of just you know in the in the mix of what I'm going to do next and I'm going to keep playing when things open back up and it's a lot of uncertainties so um yeah he just hit me up and said it was an opportunity to come over and it being I think it being George Mason and me you know obviously having a lot of a lot of memories a lot of history a lot of connections with that campus with that community is what really kind of tipped it over for me um, because I've, I've been in contact with some other coaches and I have always had the opportunity to kind of do the grad assistant thing, but it just never really felt like the right time or the right situation for me, especially when I was still trying to play. Um, but this time it was just kind of like, 
how you know how could I pass up the opportunity to kind of go back to Mason and and and, and get into it that way, especially me being from here and not having to necessarily uproot and just go and go to a new place, new city, and just complete flip, you know. And obviously my hours my hours are way different now. And, you know, back, basically back with the basketball program, that's a 24-7 job, and I'm back in school. You know, I would, I would have never told someone I would be back in school. Like, three months ago, you could ask me if I'd be in school. I'd be like, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I think, I think just the location of it and the connections that I already had at Mason, and it made it as seamless as possible. It's granted it's still a transition very very much of a transition but i think i think the situation is the most seamless transition there is so i i guess what did your relationship been like with dave paulson if any before you know he reached out to you um so I, i'm one of the guys that that tries to go up to mason and work out with handy and like kind of get in the gym when i can or just you know kind of pop in around a little bit uh so i've had a few conversations with dave paulson i think i worked one of his camps when he first came to mason so that was like five six years ago i might work a week so we've had you know a couple conversations in passing and briefly um i think we even spoke about we spoke about uh, overseas before maybe in a summer or two ago but very like light you know not necessarily a in-depth like relationship but we've we've spoken you know kind of just caught up a little bit here and there maybe three or four times we've talked before he actually called me and we had a, we had a good talk for about an hour when he initially called me. Gotcha. And so do you, I mean, without maybe giving anything away that, uh, you know, if obviously if there's something that's, you know, private between the two of you, but was there anything in particular that he, he sought you out other than obviously hearing some of the good, good reviews and everything like, why did he go get Ike Tate basically yeah. to your knowledge? Yeah, I think, yeah, to my knowledge, a lot of, I guess a lot of what I said, I mean, he, he said that, it, you know, they brought my name up initially and I think he was just extremely comfortable with, you know, the, the reception and the information and feedback that he got from, I guess, everybody that he asked, you know, uh, from, from everybody that's, that's been at Mason when I was there, you know, maybe in the administration and in offices and everybody's working on campus and, you know, the, the trainers and, and all of those people, I think he's just, I think he's just really comfortable with, with everyone's opinion and everybody's like, kind of like, yeah, you, you need to get out, you know? So I think that was more so what made, what made him kind of be able to be like, okay, cool. So um, did you, I know you kind of mentioned this a little bit. So what was your relationship like uh, with Dwayne Simpkins before even like informally, obviously no, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the area as well. I know what a big deal DeMatha is uh, in mm -hmm. terms of basketball and, and a lot of other things. And there does seem to be like, there's a lot of relationships there. Was that something that um, with coach Simpkins that, you know, you had known him a little bit before that, that number one helped you out or, you know, what was the relationship like with him before? Yeah, I think, I think that, uh, I think that helped me out a little bit as well. Me and Simp, um, our relationship, like even that, that too, is not necessarily like a deep, deep, deep rooted relationship. But when he, I think he came on at Mason as well when Paulson got here, and you know just the demathic connection. So I, I have been in a little bit more contact with Simp, uh, speaking, speaking to him, and you know at games and stuff like that. Like I'm at a lot of demathic games when I'm home, so I've seen him plenty of times at demathic games, and we've we've connected. Um, I think when I was on campus when they first got there, I connected with him, and we spoke several years ago a little bit. Um, and um yeah mostly mostly though is because of the, the, the math like i saw him i saw him at the math games this past season while i was home you know still trying to get jobs and like we would just sit there and catch up and talk you know about the team and how everything's going so you know yeah me and Sim, me and Sim had a little bit more of a relationship uh okay. what are your roles and responsibilities as a grad assistant at least so far i know you've been incredibly busy uh when you and i've been talking back and forth uh, so what is it what's been your life like so far and, and where do you see it going, I guess, in terms of what your roles and responsibilities are? Yeah. Uh, like right now, I think, I think most of my roles and responsibilities just kind of learn. I think my main responsibility is just to learn, um, you know, the hours are, you know, you got practice and, you know, from a coaching standpoint, you know, I'm, you know, in the gym from anywhere 
to 30 minutes to an hour before practice and helping out through practice, just, you know, whether it's just rebounding, listening on drills and just helping out and kind of being, you know, kind of being a shadow of, of the assistant coaches and, and just kind of getting acclimated to how practices ran and, you know, just kind of being a, and also being like a mentor and that kind of connector between the guys that are in college and, you know, the coaching staff, me being right in the middle, you know, having played at Mason, having played overseas and being, you know, like a young adult that can kind of connect with them because, you know, we're still, I'm, I'm about 10 years maybe on all of them, but we still have a lot of the same interests. You know, we probably listen to a lot of the same music and we're into the same things the same way I can relate to, you know, the coaches and stuff as well. So I think a lot of that is, um, is what, what I kind of been diving into. Um, and yeah, I guess in learning, you know, learning film and kind of, kind of getting, the, getting the hang of chopping up and, and learning the different software that they use in the film and just the structure, you know, kind of the structure of college basketball now. So it was definitely different when I was in college, you know, there was way less, there was probably way less, you know, analytics involved. There's probably way less, um, film breakdowns and, and you know now they you know they're able to look at practices they're able to look at you know all the little nooks and crannies of everything so kind of just wrapping my head around everything that's going on like you know when you're in a, when you're a basketball program you pretty much you got everything going on so that's actually a good question I was going to ask like how how it is different and if you want to expand upon that and I was going to say that even with like some of the cutting up and the analytics and things like that have you I guess number one have you seen any of that as a professional during a professional career, would you liken that a little bit more to what your college experience was like? Um, because I think when we were talking to Mike, it, it almost seemed like he had access to more things in college. Uh, obviously we were talking about like training and things like that, but like now he's got to, you know, wrap his own, tape his own ankles and things like that. So would you say that this is maybe even more, more advanced than your last couple of years professionally in terms of what you had access to? Yeah, 100%. Um, when I was in, so Canada, Canada was pretty, pretty good because, you know, you got North America. So you got a lot of people in Canada that like my, my coach, my last coach in St. John's was at NC state as a, I think as a, um, either ops or grad he, he might've done his grad assistant there. So he, he knew how to like do all of the chop ups and stuff. So we, we, we had a pretty good amount of extensive like film breakdowns and like scouting and stuff like that in Canada, which was good. But yeah, a lot of times when you're like overseas and stuff, they're, they, they're not getting, they're not getting like anywhere near the amount of analytics and resources just in terms of the technology that, that, that they're getting at now at the college level, you know, and even, you know, at the NBA level, you know, I think guys got, you know, every coach has got like an iPad with all of the, all the plays broken down, like all of the different sets and stuff. So um, and now the, pretty much at the college level, they have almost the same thing, you know, they're able to look at all of that. So it's definitely, it's definitely more. Hmm. Um, as far as, um, uh, I, I know you kind of mentioned it when you were talking about, like when you first got the text, it's like either this was about recruiting or this was about coaching. Um, a few of our alumni are coaching high school AAU. Um, I mean, at that point in time, I guess, technically you weren't a coach, you were just a, just a former player. Um, does the staff have an active relationship with, uh, you know, former players, obviously under Larenig, under Hewitt, um, that helps them with recruiting? And uh, yeah, I, I guess there's a second part to the question, but is, is that basically, um, does the staff have an active relationship with them that would help them with recruiting? Yeah. Um, really, uh, for me, I'm not, I really, I really can't say yes or no, uh, from just my little bit of time here. Uh, I do know, I do know, um, Lamar Butler's been a, been like pretty active with you know the the, um, the Mason program since he's been out of school and obviously he coaches at Paul Six. So I know he's a little bit more around in terms of like just you know things that are going on and maybe in contact with guys. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure to the extent of like how much how much contact and how much like activity that staff has with like you know just other guys or high school uh, guys at the high school level or uh, other alumni. I'm not too sure. Does a program of outreach with former players exist, and what does it involve? Right. So one of the big things that Paulson wanted um, to do as well with me was basically help me get the ball rolling on that. Yep. So um, one of my, one of my key, my, not a key responsibility, but one of the things I'm going to start to try to make sure we do is connect that, connect that, um, that gap between like the alumni from like my era and before to, you know, the current players now and try to try to get that kind of ball rolling a little bit more like how, you know, a lot of the bigger schools, 
are able to do that, you know, uh, like the, you know, the Kansas, North Carolinas, the Dukes, like they, they really are good at keeping that, keeping that ball rolling with like former players and former, you know, other pros and like, you know, guys coming back in the summer times and yeah, the I, Carolina family, you always hear about that. Yeah, yeah. Staying involved with the program and just kind of staying up to date with everybody that's going on. So yeah, that's one of the things that I'm going to be working really hard about doing is, is, is keeping that kind of patching through that, that uh, pipeline, keeping that pipeline, like getting it back kind of consistent and just kind of get it going. Cause Mason, I mean, it's a good, it's, it's always been a great community and, a, and a, you know, the, the, the success that the program has had, you know, especially being a mid-major school, the success the program has had, like, there's no reason we can't build that same type of tra- tradition over the, you know, the, the years that, that these bigger schools have had obviously for several years. But I think we have an opportunity to do the same thing because we're in that weird, we're in that weird, like little, little pocket where, we produce plenty of overseas pros, like plenty, you know? So with that being, you, you, you should be able to kind of have guys kind of be back and be around and kind of, you know, and that's just going to only help the program. That's only going to help with recruitment. That's only going to help with just fostering that, that, that family relationship and, you know, in all aspects. So I'm, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm definitely focused on trying to do. You're listening to our interview with Ike Tate on Expat Hoops. One last thank you to him for his time in this, our longest interview to date. The music you're listening to is from Antonio Hernandez. The rest of his work can be found on SoundCloud, Electric Llama Official, if you're interested. We are on the By George Podcasting Network. A thank you to them for their support as we're a month into this adventure. Let's take it to the end. Expat Hoops. <laughs> What coursework area of study are you focusing on as you're getting your master's? Yeah, uh, it just sounds it just sounds crazy thinking about it. I'm in grad school, but um, yeah, like you said, I, three months ago, you didn't know you would necessarily yeah, be doing this. Yeah, like now I got I got a, I got a whole laptop. I got books. I got assignments. I did bang the paper out yesterday. I'm just like, who am I? But um. Yeah, uh, I'm doing so. I'm. They were able to get me in. The, we have a good relationship with the sports management program, uh, the master's program. So I'm. I'm in that now. Um, which I actually like. I looked at a lot of the coursework, and it's essentially like a lot of the different industries, like with the concentration of sports. So you know, I got classes like sports marketing and sales. You got class sports finance, um, sports sports coaching and sports psychology. You know, what I mean, a lot of these type of classes. So. Uh, workload, obviously, is an adjustment to that as well. The workload, I got three, you know, three classes a semester, um, and this is uh, my first first semester. So yes, yeah, I'm I'm really just kind of getting acclimated and trying to play catch up right now. But yeah, I got got a marketing and sales class right now, and I got a sports psychology class, and then I got like a, a recreation and tourism um, kind of class I'm doing as well. One of the things is it's always I, I'm not necessarily a big fan of this question that I'm about to ask, but sort of one of the things like envisioning where you see yourself in five to 10 years. Do you see yourself coaching? Do you see yourself, what do you see yourself doing basically? Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, I actually was thinking about this like the other day, like what my, what my plan is, you know, cause the grad assistant thing is the two years, you know, you get, you get everything you need essentially to be a coach, you know, learning everything from behind the scenes to obviously being in the program, knowing how to approach things from a coaching standpoint. Um, you know, me personally, I, I do think, see myself coaching uh, one day. Um, but I also, I also know I like player development as well. Like I'm really big on player development. And before, before I um, was like, was done playing, since I've been playing, I've also been doing like player development at the same time. So when I'm home, I'm training people, you know, mm-hmm. all the way from like kids to like NBA guys, you know, I, I've, I've trained people, I've been in the gym and I've been kind of working on that skill as well over the past like four to six years. So I don't really know whether I want to do, um, whether it be try to get into the NBA, you know, level of it with, you know, with the knowing all of the, the, the um, software with all the video coordinating stuff, like I'll learn all that while I'm here. So I'll easily be able to cross that over into like the NBA ranks and maybe be able to get on the player development side there and then, you know, maybe get into coaching. Maybe I finish the two years and then I have a really good opportunity on the college level. And I'll just jump right into the college, you know, stuff. Maybe I finish these two years and somehow, you know, some way, some opens back up playing. And I'm like, oh, I went and played another year or two. And it's like, oh, I got it out of my system. Like, I'm kind of keeping it open to see what happens. Um, but, yeah, this – the transition with this was kind of really smooth and it kind of just flowed. So, I'll probably just kind of go how – whatever whatever's flowing at that right time, like whatever's kind of going on, I'll probably – 
probably just jump more towards that and what's what's available because a lot of I've been learning a lot of a lot of it is just like time and an opportunity and like what's what's available at the time you know back to um, this is probably the the part of the interview I'm actually kind of most excited about like I said earlier on the personal interest always kind of felt like you were one of the at least from the outside looking in that you were one of the the quieter players um not necessarily you know maybe in terms of keeping keeping it away from like the public and everything like yeah, that yeah. so I was going back way back this is this could even be something where your interests aren't even that anymore because I don't even remember what my interests were when I was 18 I'm 36 now um I saw on your gomason.com player bio <laughs> that your hobbies include I uh hockey golf and chess are yeah. there still interests or are those were just something you put down on your bio yeah so it's a funny story um so um you're familiar with Lil Wayne, obviously. I know you know Lil Wayne. Yep. So in high school, um, in high school, he had he had a mixtape out, dedication to mixtape, and there was a there was a little interlude, little skit. Um, I think the song was called Sports Center. And he was just like, he started off, he's like, sports, 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 man. I like sports. He was like, I like basketball, baseball, football. And he was just rambling all sports. And like when he, when he was like at the end of the center, he was like hockey, golf, like, and he's like, I, I watch everything. So in high school, that kind of became an inside joke about like just hockey, golf, like the way he just kind of threw them out there. Um, so I think I did a bio in high school. And when I, I think I did, I think they, they might have took the bio from high school and copied and pasted it on Go Mason, or I might have just refilled out the same exam. <laughs> Either or, I do, but it's like, it's one of those things like where you're, where you're typing it, you're like smiling on my face. I'm like, I just know why, like where this came from, where I pulled it from. Um, but I do, I do, I do like hockey a little bit now. Um, I mean, they play hockey all in Canada. It's, hockey's on TV every day. So I was watching a little bit the hockey I do like golf I've never been able to get into golfing just because you know I'm a little bit busy you know golf is kind of that thing that thing you do when you kind of get a little bit older and get a little bit more time to yourself that's like the leisure so now mm -hmm. now I'm probably be working on my swing um but uh, aside from me aside from top golf a little bit of putt putt which I think I think I got a nice I got I think I got a nice, uh, decent drive I think my drive is pretty decent but um talk to Tony about that at some point in time because Tony played golf in high school and uh, it's Tony and I play golf probably most frequently with one another. And it's definitely something that I, I relate entirely to. I just need to do it more. I'm like, I'm like, oh man, they, 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 they like the golf, the golf questions were like very layered. I'm like, I'm going to have to go ahead and tell them like, yeah, I haven't golfed like for real, but I do, I do. Like I watched, you know, there's been plenty of golf and tennis and stuff on TV. Like I'll sit there and watch for sure. You're plant-based vegan. How long have you been plant-based vegan or which, what's the term that you would use? Yeah, I got you. Um, So we're working on, what September about two years ten months um, um, vegetarian I'm vegetarian so plant based was like mostly plants I have well my diet specifically I um I eat eggs on occasion and I'm not like a stickler for like cheese I'm not I'm not a cheese addict but like I'm not anal about if it's cheese on some so if I go eat some pizza it's gonna be some cheese you know a lot of things have like eggs and cheese and like you know pasta and stuff like that so just because of like my active lifestyle on the move like if you're a vegan you gotta you gotta really meal prep like very anally meal prep and you gotta really watch that and you have to really pay attention to what's and everything and maybe i'll get that to that one point like maybe one day i'll get there but right now like i'm just a little bit too active on the move to like really be settled down and like planning that much but vegetarian is fairly i got my i got the hang of that it's fairly easy you know you got a lot a lot of vegetarian options at a lot of places um you know i'm i'm big on i'm big on fresh fruit a lot of fresh fruit a lot of um a lot of like sunflower seeds cashews peanuts like walnuts like i snack on that all the time um but yeah so Two two years, ten months, uh, and when October starts, uh, vegetarian, and it, it started. Um, I always, I've always been like fairly healthy, not necessarily like not eating meat, but I've always eaten fairly healthy. When I was in China, I um, it was this really good international grocery store that we was going to, and I was able to kind of go and like just cook a lot and prepare a lot of my meals myself. So I kind of just started, I kind of started playing around with different, you know, different recipes and. And and I and for whatever reason it just kind of naturally happened. I was like, right, let me let me see if I can go without meat this week. And then I would like do that for a week, or then I would like just do like seafood for a week if I wanted some meat or something like that. And that I kind of went back and forth with that when I was in China, which was kind of prepping myself for it, which I didn't even realize. 
And then when I went to when I went to visit Mike in Germany, I kind of just I kind of just went went off the wagon. You know, I'm German. I'm in gyros, then halal. I'm you know you know you know good European foods, kebab oh, yeah. specials. So I, I went like off the rails over there. Um, and then around the time I was coming back home, like I kind of just like right around the new year, it wasn't even a plan, but right around the new year, I was just like, you know what? Uh, I'm done eating meat. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just put it down, see how it goes. Um, so I did that. Uh, that was like right when 2018 started and, um, yeah, it's been, it's been two years, um, you know, ups and downs. I really didn't want to do it while I was still playing either. So me playing that season in Canada, uh, vegetarian, was good and then it was bad like because the when I switched teams the first couple months was perfect um it was great we had like we was doing doing Costco trips every week and we had great great groceries at kitchen I was cooking and all that got traded well got picked up cut and picked up by the edge and we were I literally flew out to a road trip we were on a road trip and we were on the road for that whole first month and a half we came home it was the beginning of February from February to like mid March. We might've had three home games. So when I flew out, I flew out and I was on, um, I flew out and I was on, on the road, kind of on the move. Didn't have like all of the stuff that I was used to having. And you could feel your levels kind of going up and down and you start kind of feeling anxious. And then it just kind of became a thing every day. I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm more so just worried about like not passing out and I know I need something, but I don't know what it is. So that was a little bit up and down for me. But then about mid March, early April, when we got back settled in, I kind of got like the range back on it. And, um, and now I've been cool ever since, but that was, yeah, that was, that was a transition. Like just dealing with like, okay, I got to really make sure I got everything I need, you know, but um, now it's good though. It's good. I, I don't know if I'll ever go back to you near anything. If they had to ask me now, I say no, but you know, so that's actually, so would you say you probably consider like cooking to be, I don't know if I want to say a hobby, but maybe for lack of a better term, is that like a hobby for you? Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, I want to, I look forward to when I have like my own, like, like space and time and just can really like kind of cook, especially cause you like on YouTube, I'm on, I'm big on YouTube, not just for like food, but like I'm on YouTube a lot, watching a lot of stuff. And there's a lot of like, you know, little easy, you can easily just pull up YouTube videos. It's a couple vegan like chefs that I follow and I'm not I'm not a fan of like always doing like the mock meats and stuff like that because a lot of times they're not they're just as unhealthy as like some other stuff but yeah. but you know every now and then when you just kind of feel a craving have a craving for like oh like you know like most recently I had I saw like a, a vegan catfish recipe and like I'm looking at it like oh that's probably pretty good you know what I mean like so I I, I, I want to look forward to being like, let me try this little vegan recipe like let me try this vegan steak or this vegan you know so I'm, I want to try to do like maybe one or two of those like a week like just sit down and be like all right let me go to the store get all the ingredients and kind of make a little pseudo meat type meal and, and, and do that so what is what's your what's your chili recipe roughly I mean without getting into specifics like what's what's in it um so yeah I do I do um tomato uh, to like a sometimes I do lazy version. You just get like the tomato kind of sauce, whatever. But do that like some canned tomatoes. Um, definitely some cloves of garlic, onions. Um, you know, simmer those, saute those. I throw I throw in the tomato base and stuff. Um, with mint, with mine I do I do black beans and I do like chickpeas and sweet potatoes. So I'll roast. I like um I'll boil some sweet potatoes and then I throw them in the oven. And then you know, get them soft, cut them up, and then throw the throw the sweet potatoes in. And then, you know, you just gotta start to start to churn churn your little pot, churn your little pot. I like I like my food uh, spicy though, so it's definitely gonna be some some paprika, some some red pepper flakes, you know, a little bit of cumin, a couple of different little herbs and spices and stuff. And and it's and a little thick too. I like the chili being a little thick. And then I had a I had a pro pro tip. Um, I was told to I was told to take some of the chili and blend it up and make it like almost like a, you know, like a soup, blend it up and then throw that back in to make the chili, I guess, more, more consistent and like kind of savory. That's interesting. So, I hadn't heard that. Cause I'm usually yeah. a big proponent of like, um, like I kind of took this concept from my mom where she, when she would make like apple pie and stuff like that, use like different kinds of apples and stuff like that. So like, I take that, like when it goes to like chili and some other things, like you put different kinds of beans and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it was good to hear that you, you know, obviously chickpeas, and I think you said black beans and stuff like that. It's definitely something that I'll do. I'll use like usually kidney instead of chickpeas, but mm -hmm. I can see myself doing that. Mushrooms. Um, mushrooms? For sure, yeah. 
Interesting. That's got to be something that, like, in terms of, like, as a meat meat replacement, that kind of probably mimics that a little bit, too. Yeah. So that's interesting. One of the most recent ones that I made, it had sweet potatoes in it, but I don't think I roasted them quite the way that you did. I'd be interested to try that, but also put quinoa in there that kind of thickened it up a little bit, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Ken, so- thank you so much for all the time. You're, it's great content. Good sitting down with you and, and getting to virtually meet you. Um, I know you're, you're really, really busy right now. So certainly appreciate it. Um, and being so willing to fit us in like this. Appreciate it. And that was our interview with former Mason men's basketball player, Ike Tate. Hope you enjoyed. Please give us a like or subscribe on all of our social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. We also have a special bonus episode with both Ike and Mike Morrison together having a good time. If you're on YouTube, look for it there or on Spotify for our audio only version, depending on where you're listening to us now. Soon we may have an update from Fallon Stevens on the start of her time in Iceland's League 2. You can find our first interview with her and our other interviews on our social media or giantkiller.co or on Spotify. It's Expat Hoops. For Andy Hoverman, I'm Tony Budney. Be sure to subscribe to see what comes next. (laughs) 